I'm Alex Hills and I'm an apprentice uh, cutter at a company called Dijon Skinner on Savile Row. It's a military and civilian tailors. So we do military uniforms and civilian tailoring. Um, before that I trained as a coat maker. So I was uh, a practicing coat maker making jackets and overcoats, morning coats, anything with sleeves essentially. I do like um, historic reenactment of the early 20th century. So I enjoy like, a lot of civilian menswear from that period, but I also um, do a bit of Second World War reenacting on the British side of things. Uh, the history of the 20th century is sort of tied up in, in war and, and people's reactions to it. So um, a lot of fashion was influenced by it um, as well. So I find that very interesting. To be honest, when I was very little, I was very into the Middle Ages and I used to do uh, medieval reenacting. I used to do a lot of like longbow archery and that sort of thing. And I, I used to convince my dad to take me to reenactment events. And he used to dress up uh, much against his better judgment, but I used to love it. And um, I think I've been dressing up ever since really. I think when I was about uh, 14 or 15, I'd, I'd, or maybe a bit younger than that even, I'd, I'd, I'd watched like a series on, on ITV called Jeeves and Worcester and it was set in the 1930s and I absolutely just loved what like Bertie Worcester was wearing and I, I thought you know, that's, that was an era when like people really knew about clothing and knew about how to put together an outfit and I started collecting a lot of vintage original vintage from the time um, but as a teenager my budget didn't extend to much and I was trying to work out ways of doing it like cheaper and and trying to make it myself and I think at that point I realised that I really wanted to learn how to make it properly and that's when I got interested in bespoke tailoring. So first of all I'll show you our pattern room. So this is where all the patterns are kept. Um, they're all in alphabetical order and what we do is we keep our customers patterns in there. So, oh here we go. Oh. So here we go, we've got Prince Harry's pattern here. So this has got his card pattern in here that we uh, draft uniforms and bits of here. That's a, a panel for um, a part of a patrol back. Yeah. So that's all cool. saved and it's, you know, um, when we see him next, we'll take some more measures and we might uh, change or alter the pattern. But we've always got that there as like a permanent reference for yeah. his size and shape. How would you describe your personal style? Well, I think I'd describe it as like the British equivalent of Ivy. Mm -hmm. So it's a sort of idea of a sort of student, like Oxbridge undergraduate sort of student of like the interwar period. So, you know, um, although it's tailored, it's a bit more casual, um, big trousers, very comfortable look on the bottom half, and then maybe quite neat and tailored on the top half. Um, and it gives it quite a sporty sort of casual look that I quite like. Um, it's not necessarily the sort of formal buttoned up look of the sort of more Edwardian period. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I quite like the, the, the late 20s and the 30s, I think. So your main inspiration are old magazines? Yes, I mean like illustrations as well. Um, a lot of the photographs from the period are all black and white and then you might see an illustration by like Lawrence Fellows, um, who was an illustrator for Esquire. Um, and a power arts and his stuff's all in colour and it really brings it to life. You get to see um, those designs in the colours they were meant to be in and, and not a black and white photograph. Um, I think the first thing I made was I made a pair of like grey flannel trousers and I was about uh, 15. I, I, do you know what, unfortunately I threw them away the other year. Um, they weren't the best made, like they were like, I bought some um, stuff that claimed to be grey flannel and it was, it was like a nice old like grey woolen fabric that I think was French in its origin um, but I didn't have any of the other bits and pieces so I think the pocket bags and waistband were made out of an old pillowcase um, and I did it on my mum's or well, my grandmother's sewing machine I did all the sewing on that and um, I cut the pattern myself from an old tailor and cutter article so to be fair I'm quite pleased with it. they went together as a pair of trousers and they looked okay is there a piece that you made that you are particularly fond of? I've got a few bits and pieces now. Often the memories of putting them together are quite... Um, I maybe enjoy... I remember them more fondly for the, the make that went into them and uh, necessarily even like the style. I think I've moved on a little bit over recent years, but... Um, yeah, often like a piece of fabric might have a story. And I like using vintage fabric because 
it's had a whole story before I've even had like a, my hands on it. Um, yeah, I'm looking at a few bits and pieces now that I'm quite looking forward to starting making. I've got this, I absolutely love this, and I haven't done anything with it because I'm trying to work out what to do with it. There's probably like a suit length of this, um, but it's an old like 1930s or 40s crombie length. But it's a, a really nice brown with a, like a blue fleck in it. I think I might do a sports jacket, but yeah. Sometimes it's just, I get the collecting bug, I just see cloth and I have to buy it. It always turns up in really unlikely places, um, like charity shops or like, a, like a, like a really old lady's haberdashery place. And they might have like a selection of cloth and it might all be like polyesters from like the 90s and that sort of thing. And then there'll be like one or two real gems in there. Um, the other thing is if you've got someone who you know is a tailor who lives near you, um, they might have some really amazing old stock that has been, they've hidden away and kept to one side and they don't think it's fashionable and even their customers, but it might be something that's really nice and, and worthwhile buying and making yourself something out of. And I think uh, especially with like making something yourself is within reason, whatever you can dream up as an idea, you can make, you've just got to find the material, you know. I'm at a point now where I can, I can see a, a picture of a fancy back from the 1930s and I can sit, see how that's made and I just got to find like a, uh, an ideal fabric to go to to make it. And um, a lot of people in the vintage scene always refer to like the holy grail of uh, like a vintage find. And I find that I've, I can just make my holy grail when I want to, which is, um, I'm in a very lucky position to do that. And I, I know I'm lucky and I try to be quite humble about it, but um, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. <laughs> I think I think the thing is with tailoring is you never you're never finished you never finish learning and I think you could talk to a a, a coat maker or a, a, a cutter in their 60s and 70s and they'll they'll still be given stuff that makes them think and they have to um, uh, experiment you know they never stop experimenting um, because you might be given a customer who's got a very weird shape about them and you've got to make them look the best they possibly can and that's not always easy um, some people have some very strange figures or some people might be quite a bit of a tummy on them um, but you want to make them look like they've got a waist and, and, and elegant as possible and that's a skill and you can always improve and even if you're making you know you might put a a collar on or a top collar on and the next day you think oh I've thought of a completely different way of doing it and it will completely revolutionize the way that you do stuff and and that's the thing that's exciting about it is it's an, evolu it's an evolution you know and um, anyone who says they're, they're the master of everything is, is telling lies I think. The main thing about cuts is making something that's flattering for someone you know, and, and um, that exaggerates their good points and, and um, uh, makes their bad points a little bit more subtle. Um, so you, that's the main thing. You've always, when, when a customer comes in, they may have a certain idea of what they want, uh, but you, it's your job as a cutter to steer them in the right direction. For example, if it was a really big guy, you probably wouldn't do him a, a Prince of Wales check, double-breasted suit because it's just not going to look right. It's just going to make him look enormous. You might go for something a bit more, you know, slimming like a, a two-button single-breasted jacket in a stripe. And then um, imagine people's expectations as well is another thing. Um, people can walk in one thinking that they're going to put on a bespoke suit and it's going to make them look like Gary Cooper. If they don't have a body of Gary Cooper, then they're still going to look like um, Joe Bloggs. So you need to... Um, you can do your best, but that's about it, I think. A lot of this managing people's psychology and giving, some, giving them a product they're really happy with, but not necessarily the thing they walk in wanting, because if you made them exactly what they wanted, they might not be happy with it. And you've, you've basically got a customer who's you know, not happy, and that's exactly the opposite of what anyone wants. Anyone wants to walk out of their door, with a big smile on their face with a suit they're gonna wear for years. So a lot of it's down to like styling, and I think that's one thing that we never really like shout about is the fact that we, you know, we, we will style people who come through the door. Um, and the thing is, not everyone wants the house style anymore. 
like our, you know, at Dijon Skinner, we're quite a traditional tailors and we, our roots are in the military. So we do quite a, you know, not an overly structured shoulder, but we do quite a traditional English cut. And some people will come in and they'll want something that's really soft and very Italian and um, that's more like wearing a cardigan. And we can make that, that's certainly within our skill set, but um, that doesn't work for every figure yeah. either. So we try and um, push them towards a direction which we think is a compromise for work. I think if you, if you give them the right reasons for it and you make a good case for something, then people are quite happy to go along with what you think's best. I mean, I've been wearing trousers with like, you know, uh, 22 inch bottoms. And um, I think people haven't worn trousers this wide since the 1970s. And I think, um, I think men generally are always 10, about a decade or 15 years behind their, like where women are going with stuff. I think women have been wearing wider leg trousers with higher waists for you know a number of years now, and I don't reckon it'll be long before men start you know start wearing stuff that actually sits on their waist, um, and maybe it's a little bit more flattering over the seat, so they might start wearing pleated trousers again. Um, that's something we always encourage as, as a tailors anyway. Um, so maybe we'll see a uh, resurgence in the wider leg, and um, and some and some more structured tailoring, I think. Um, people have been very much into the Italian stuff, and I think that's great. It's, it's nice that people are actually wearing classic menswear. I don't mind what it looks like, I just, I just like the fact that people are wearing jackets, you know. And um, that's the thing we're looking at post-pandemic, you know. You're looking at um, um, a workforce that doesn't have to wear a suit into work anymore, yeah. necessarily. Um, but we still want their custom, so we're going to try and sell them like sports jackets and, and blazers and stuff like that. But um, they can feel more comfortable in, and they can wear casually, and they can also wear socially. They don't have to wear um, uh, a three-piece chalk stripe suit to work, so they can wear. They can get something they can get more wear out of generally. And um, I think people are more price conscious now, so it's about pushing those things. But um, something they can wear as a suit they can also wear as a sports jacket and um, just trying to get people to understand that the versatility of their own wardrobe um, you know to be happy with less but maybe pay more money and get a better quality uh, garment at the res as a result of it you know um, so that's what I'd like to see I'd like to see people spending less or spending buying less spending more yeah. and getting something they can look uh, use for you know a decade and love it all the time so yeah